he is not here he's trying to join in again this season. all right no problem we'll start but uh, we'll wait for uh, i mean we'll have him join later uh, may i just give the input because i was sent into the audience and then i came into the panelists maybe he's also waiting in that uh, in the audience there please check for his ids there yes ma'am so he had joined as an attending is there uh namaskar sir namaskar namaskar ma'am are you able to see me or are you able to no i'm not i'm able to hear you i'm not able to see you uh then you really how can i join because i am able to see you. you are able to see us no okay. are you able to see us Yes. yes yes now we are namaskar sir namaskar. thank you so much for gracing the panel and uh, uh, chetanya ji brother chetanya ji is the next panelist and uh, then we have miss priyanka bhatkoti and uh, yeah yes so now that we have allow me to begin good All right yes good afternoon everyone i kuhika dhingra Welcome you all to the twelfth episode of the web series Decoding NEP twenty twenty, brought to you by Edudave School of Inspired Teaching and Learning in association with Amrita Vishwa with the Peetham University. Continuing our discussion on the dynamic reforms in the national education policy regarding higher education in India, today our esteemed panelist and moderator will deliberate about higher ed opportunities and challenges ahead. We are grateful to welcome Ms. Priyanka Bhatkoti, Principal, Maxworth School, Dwarka, on our panel today. An acclaimed educationist, she is keenly involved in the development of curriculum and assessment at CBSC. An eminent resource person for training educators, she has also been the recipient of Catalyst Award for Excellence in Education. Ms. Bhatkoti is great, greatly renowned for her paramount teaching experience and innovative methodologies. We welcome you, ma'am. We are honored to welcome Dr. Devendra Pathak, Vice Chancellor, Uttaranchal University, on our panel today. Dr. Pathak has more than 30 years of teaching experience in India and UK. Serving as a Vice Chancellor in many universities, he has also been awarded the Indira Gandhi Excellence Award for Outstanding Achievement in Higher Education. Dr. Pathak's expertise in the management of higher education systems and procedures, alongside His international exposure in teaching economics is an established benchmark of excellence. We welcome you, sir. I am delighted to introduce you to our esteemed panelist, Maheshwara Chetanya Ji, Chairman of the Undergraduate Ad Admissions of the School of Engineering, Amrita Vishwa with the Peetham University. Maheshwara Maheshwara Ji has more than fifteen years of teaching experience in the field of computer science and engineering. a dynamic expert in his field chetanya ji also serves as the contest director for international collegiate programming contest his humility expertise and ideologies continue to inspire us all we are honored to welcome you sir i heartily welcome our moderator for the session education evangelist ms devyani kapoor a former principal author and passionate edu leader Ms Kapoor carries over 3 decades of experience in the education sector a pragmatic thought leader she is the founder and ceo of edudays school of inspired teaching and learning accredited for introducing numerous innovative pedagogical techniques ms kapoor has created new benchmarks in the field of education welcome ma'am once again i welcome all of you who have just joined the session and now i hand over the baton to our moderator ms devyani kapoor Thank you so much, Kuhika, and a heartwarming welcome to all our esteemed panelists today. With the overwhelming response to our last episode, in fact, we wanted to have only two for the higher ed, but because of the responses, we will now take deliberations forward to the road ahead in higher ed, and this time, it is delving into. the challenges that mar the higher ed institutions and the opportunities that lay within reviving higher education in india uh, has seen a dramatic increase 
say from about a few universities to a few thousand universities in the capacity of higher education sector in the last two decades. I have in front of me some figures that I will quote and that are very indicative of that what an experiential growth that we have seen in higher education. With the gross enrollment ratio, it was 26.3 percentage. Uh, we are close to achieving the, and this was in 2008, we are close to achieving 32% GER by 2022. There are certain challenges that mark the universities, higher education, and the processes related. Some of them like low employability of graduates, poor quality of teaching, weak governances, sufficient funding, insufficient funding, some complex regulatory norms. They may seem jargons to us at this point, but let us now delve into what exactly they mean and why are we talking about them? So uh, my eyes breaking question starts from here. Now, let me introduce you to our three rounds. First is the eyes breaking round where each panelist gets a time limit of two minutes and panelists please adhere to the time limit. We start with Dr. Pata, then uh, Brother Mahesh Chaitanya, followed by Ms. Priyanka Bhattuki. Second round is our specialized round where each panelist gets one or two questions and we seek their perspective and insights on the same topic. And the last but not the least is our Q&A round where our audience seek their queries from our esteemed panelists. So moving on to our ice breaking and continuing uh, our ice breaking question from my introduction, I would request panelists to very quickly and briefly let our audience know what in your uh, perspective are the two most important challenges and what could be the opportunities that lie within for the higher education in India. So moving on to Dr. Uh, Pathak. Yes, thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, uh, distinguished panelists, really it's a privilege for me. For me, the higher education is all along been receiving the requests. And uh, it, it has been one of the most significant contributors for the knowledge economy, which is very, very important, crucial and critical for India. There's two aspects that I feel, the concern of the parents and the students, from their perspective only I'll, I'll speak. So one is efficacy of the output, and efficacy of the output, and second is value for the money. Efficacy of the output, I mean, the student, he wants that my output when I say pass out, what will be my efficacy, whether I will be acceptable to me, society and to the industry, or will I be able to stand on my own? Will I be able to have a startup? And second, the parent who has invested this much of money, he is expecting that how he is going to get back the return on investment. And the students are equally as well. Now, these are the pollers. But then the real question is that we as a custodian of the higher education, really, honestly speaking, we are simply churning out a brigade of only degree holders and virtually they have been completely disconnected with the requirement of the industries. And as SHM, they have put it that only 23 per 16 lakhs of students every year they are appearing for the G exam. And normally 10 to 12 lakh students, they get entry into engineering stream, whenever five years they get entry into management stream. It's 17, 20 lakhs of students, so adding every year for the higher education being put to, to, today, it is 37 million students are there in all at the higher education. The early sending report says by 2030, 140 million students they will be joining the higher education. Because now in the age, our target of age that is 18 to 25 years, some 15 crores youngsters are there. 
if we had it extended to 35 years, another 27 crores will be added. Total 42 crores are also almost so expecting to get the higher education. And the 60% of our population in India, that is a young population, and median being the 29 years. So really, this is really a challenge that we are really the thousand plus universities, of two thousand colleges. We have been in so many all faculty members, but virtually whether we have been able to really serve the purpose for all these two edifices has been neglected. That's really a challenge. Then there actually some two aspects are there. One, our academic dispensation is completely disconnected the wire of the real requirement of the right. society. And the right. second, second, on the part of the students also, that much seriousness the value is missing. Because the value, unless and until the value addition is a value proposition added in the education. Because they simply have come here, the normal question whenever I go for, say, any industry program, I ask you, raise your hand, how many have come for getting the degree? So automatically, so many hands say, say they start getting raised up. Then I asked, I told them, you are not here, you are not fit for continuing your study, because here you are not, will not be you to be a little bit But then, how to how far we have been able to really substantiate it? That's really a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. then so many other reasons are there, which really mm -hmm. we will discuss later. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, very rightly said, the two most important challenges are, one is that the gap which exists, the values uh, system has to be created. And secondly, is the disconnect that there is between the curriculum and the real life expectations that we are churning out photocopies of the same kind of you know, category of students. Thank you so much. Over to you, uh, Maheshwa Chaitanyaji. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. I'll just start from where uh, Dr. Devendra Patek talked. Uh, one is uh, certainly uh, he rightly pointed the value system because uh, the technology is growing just like anything and it has become a part and parcel of our life. And how is it possible for us to uh, inculcate those those values in uh, in uh, or along with the curriculum, along with the teaching? How is it possible for us to make sure that the values are also uh, imparted across the higher education sector. The, the second thing is from, the, from a professional point of view, if you look from the career point of view, how far are they skilled? Or what is the type of skill we are able to impart? So uh, basically it has to start from the school itself because now, now that NEP is also coming up, they have started rolling out the NEP and what is expected in the higher education sector the most important thing is the students who are able to solve the problems. Students who are able to think from a critical point of view. I always cite one best example. I'm sure that uh, Priyanka ma'am would know. The way in which the, the exam was conducted last year, the way in which the, the JE mains and CBC exams were conducted last year, the kind of preparations the school principals had to take. Basically, that was a problem solving skill, right? From thinking from a different dimensions, Thinking, thinking from different perspective and putting down a solution with the help of technology. So we had to remove all this paper, 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 uh, paperwork and we made it paperless. So how is it possible for the undergrad students to become problem solvers? And that has to happen rightly from the school level. So combined with the skills for the career and life and value system, using the technology effectively and not misusing the technology, these two components are very, very critical for the future. And especially this is the, this is the right opportunity to inculcate. At the same time, we are facing challenges also. So that is my take on, on this, uh, ma'am. Thank you so much. I think very rightly because the, the underlying, underlying theme that is coming up with this is that two things hold uh, importance, which is skills and values. And skill... Uh, the, requ required, the required skills that are required by a 21st century student and a value system that has to be 
uh, started, uh, you know, nurturing the students with the value system from the school itself. Now, uh, over to you, Miss Priyanka, and I would want you to build upon where uh, Chetanya ji left because this is something really relevant, and the whole conversation has come so beautifully weaved around. to have come to you yes, uh, yes i'm so uh, grateful to dr pathak and dr uh, uh, brother chetanya out here he's already uh, uh, set the road for me to walk on so to speak <laughs> <laughs> yes and especially because sir brought in chetanya sir brought in the element of critical thinking and thinking skills out there because that is the need of the art so when i am looking into it from the perspective of schools and students who come to us at 3 plus and are almost 18 by the time they are entering into college out there we get a wider spectrum of time and a wide wider spaces of age that the students are going through so flexibility and control in school level are much higher so school education becomes very important for success of higher education at higher education stage the faculty have huge width of curriculum and uh, out there like in our 10th and 12th what we have the board exams and the result to take care of so to take classes per se on value or to integrate them out there will be a very tall order if it is already done and students come who have very high goals on citizenship very high levels of critical thinking and problem solving and applying knowledge into real life are uh, 90% of the work is already done so first thing that i bring to the takeaway is, is two two things that i'm going to talk about at a secondary level we have to make our students independent learners and they have to look at the interconnectedness of things out there if they are seeing something in the book they have to make connections with the real world if they look at themselves as an individual they also have to train themselves as good team players so that they are able to contribute not just to their colleges to their projects but to the community as a whole the next part that i would like to share is that there is a cost to everything and resources are there so schools have to play a very strong role and with nep talking about genius and talent identification and prodigies out there because up till now if you look into education it is working on remediation it is working on you know need basis not that long vision balance with short sighted so we have to balance the two out there so talent identification has to happen at school level with the school teachers and parents working together that this child is a genius in this let's send them over to higher education here not just fixated on certain careers because they are they are drawing uh, or in the uh, newspaper or news drawing trps by the kind of salary packages they are drawing because in the next 10 years the kind of salary packages and jobs are going to change the the whole demography is going to change out there so we have to make at school level our secondary learners lifelong learners they are going to be in higher education and they will change their careers or grow in their careers at least 6 to 7 times they will have to learn always not just at higher education level out there so they have to be taught how to learn on their own and no, those no. are the skills that i am talking about if we give these two things to our students at school level i am sure higher education will create a wonderful success story which is globally renowned so the bridge so, between school I, and colleges has to be strong there great thank you so much uh, ms priyanka and for uh bridging this gap and giving the kind of a road map to the schools that before you hand over the students to universities you please ensure work upon the uh, their uh, creating uh interconnectedness between the curriculum and the real life and also very important making them independent learners i think this round went so beautifully and uh, it was very smooth and seamlessly done round thank you so much uh moving on to our second segment where each panelist gets uh, about two or one or two questions depend upon the time i move on to dr pater sir the need to enhance employability of graduates because that's what uh, national education policy is also talking about that you know creating individuals and creating employable uh, t uh, structure of graduates is an entry point for collaboration of enterprise education and uh, entrepreneurship links with industry research skills and wide range of you know transferable skills which is also communication or english i would probably say when they go out in the industry so uh, the emerging interests of indian higher education and institutions in the vocational 
skills market provide areas for potential engagement with international partners this is something which is happening a lot can you suggest ways in which higher educational institutions can foster learners who are ready to face these real life so that it doesn't happen that in school also they are studying textbooks and uh, so education is not just about studying textbooks and passing exams what is that different thing that universities need to look at to create employability and create that interconnected ji sir there man two two things i foresee one very rightly priyanka man has told to had see the fear of life for the higher education if the foundation is weak the building will be weak and the entire brain if at all is to be shared for the all lot in the higher education it is all the our curriculum the curriculum really needs a drastic change a complete reorientation reengineering redesigning rewriting recasting And uh, this recasting, rewriting, it has to be in tune with the requirement of the traditional industry or the society. That's why now the UGC and the other higher body of the NP also 2020 will get prohibited now. That in the while say preparing the curriculum, we we'll have to take into consideration the local needs, the regional needs, the state needs, the national needs. So what are really the things? Not that simply we have been. Teaching all those old things, stories which are redundant, which are obsolete, that really do not have any application at all. So the real thing is a one, say, massive or really a fundamental change in the curriculum, which is the curriculum number one. Number two, the fostering the social orientation or mindset of the students. The students they are now self-centered. They want to get a job. That is the ultimate aim of the students. So they actually in our say in the Watton Watton School in Philadelphia, there is a social service which is companies company service. Just ma'am, I referred about the vocational training. Now the national scheme vocational training corporation set up by government of India. They have right made a very right thing that you are working certain number of hours in a factory and that you are getting an expertise and then you are bringing a certificate. That much credit will be added and that will be if you have to. Grade level or say diploma level. So these things have to come so that instead of simply going through all the theory and other things, we really get a skill which is useful. And the one the very structure of our higher education now, now we are having say forty two thousand colleges. You just think of the diploma polytechnics. They are hardly two thousand three hundred. Well, I mean, man, I'm very correct in told those who are not really efficient. Why should they be asked to go only to the higher education? Everybody is MA or MTA or something. But of what use? So they actually use a number of the polytechnics. That should be so. Our entire this curve itself, the tower itself, we say, the, 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 in a different fashion. There should be more number of the polytechnic. Then there should be other say graduation college, and the higher education that will be. Less and less. Now the maximum number of institutes are higher only, and practically they are disoriented. They don't have any. So in inclusion of all the requirements of the industry, that will have to be brought in this one. We say transition from teaching to learning that has to be ensured. And the pedagogy we are telling pedagogy means child, and gogy means method of teaching. We we need an andragogy because we are we in the higher education we are teaching. Not the child. We are teaching the elders, youngsters, and who are really now there. They will be going and they will be serving the society. So these things, unless and until these are being are bridged, the industry and academia gap is being that ma'am has rightly as I pointed out. So clearly, the education will remain worthless, meaningless, and will not serve the purpose for which really it is meant. Thank you so much. but i want to uh, you know we have two panelists from the higher ed and one we have from uh, the uh, you know uh, schools so my question is we have so much talking today about values weren't they always there were we waiting for an nep to tell us that you listen we need to now start working on life skills we need to start we are talking about there is a lot of gap who was stopping us from doing that why were the schools not doing why were the higher university higher ed not 
so i i'm sorry the question was i was very tempted so much of talk about value system we do see crisis uh, in the value system and social crisis schools have always been talking about high value just a bite from each one of you on this i'm sure the parents would be willing to know that uh, was it nep should have come then say decades back yes sir one minute to discipline here and the sanity level school is the high students they are need to be cited in the covid time also how many students they have gone and really went back to society to the needy even for feeding them who were needing the food so very how many will come and the sanity we respect we know the problems we discuss and anxiety of others that that's why the emotional quotient of a, a student has to be stronger than the intelligent quotient or the physical quotient that means schools were not doing justice to it yes priyanka ma that simply the uh, schools were not i think what sir i would like to take it man the schools are better than our higher education schools really they only are giving some some values and once they come there or to just like you guys in karo duniya mein kyun hai aur the i think they not there to check them And Gee, are, yes, Priyanka, very briefly. Yes, sir. We okay. have heard you now, Priyanka, very briefly. Yeah, uh, yes. I, I would like to take it that sir has again honored the uh, us that schooling is very important. He doesn't mean that we have not been doing the task out here. Only thing is, we have to realize that values are caught; they are not taught. The students who are coming to us live in an ecosystem. There is a home, there is a school, and there is a community. Now, as there are certain values which are universal values, res uh, respect for parents, teachers, and giving back to the environment that you are in is universal. This was there at the time of Rama, and it's going to be there hundred years from now. Even when we are habitating colonies on Mars or Jupiter or whatever is going to happen there, but certain values are contextual values also. Like at a given point of time in history, maybe. the ladies were highly protected because there were lots of wars going on so the gentry which was fighting the war out there they they are taking care of future generation that you take care of the home and i'll fight the war and come back to you but now the the woman is there who's a fighter pilot as well that does not mean that our value system has gone down the drain out there it means that we are geared up to face up the challenges of the present time now the good part is that we are not aping what is happening in xyz place unnecessarily we are looking at ourselves and india has now that sufficient level of maturity and awakening in the present generation that what has to be valued through time a united states or a united kingdom need not tell us we are very strong in our family values out there we can teach that to the whole world yes. very true very true thank you thank you so much i think there we were like my take is that where we were lacking was that in schools the values and uh, you know life skills were uh you know some were segregated to a moral science period moral science or a, now we are across. trying to integrate yes. uh, in all in subjects curriculum yes very rightly so put across all subjects in the life and school subjects. itself yes. when you walk into to, to the corridor yes. you look yes. at a teacher you yes. should be learning from a teacher how to behave yeah yeah <laughs> thank you priyanka ma'am thank you moving on to our it was a very nice discussion and i was very tempted to take it up moving on to a next question and next panelist uh chetanya ji now if we look at the you know the statistics from post independent from where we started with 20 universities to probably now we have uh, say about 1000 universities and 40000 colleges or even more these are the statistics that are got from to, uh, 2019 um, now uh, last decades we've seen that somewhere the government has taken uh i wouldn't say a step back from its room but government's primary funding only goes to union uh you know uh universe central universities and state universities now uh, these private universities which have mushroomed and which are contribute major contributors of you know expansion of higher ed uh, education a higher education we see their uh, expenditures are very high and uh, their dependence is on student fee now again uh, student fee 
depends upon what is that background where the student comes from how much you know they are able to so those uh, are some of the challenges which i was reading uh, you know and now we see that yes what measures should you uh, suggest should be taken to probably strengthen this kind of a public private partnership where probably the government proactively comes forward and you know uh, become a stakeholder with uh, private uh, universities and what are those measures what is the we would like to yeah okay ma'am it is a really nice question uh because and it is one of the important challenges uh, faced by universities for example recently i have seen that the uh, the funding from the government has uh, come down uh in the uh it is partially maybe the because you use the right word that mushrooming of institutions where uh, we saw we saw that a large number of uh, the students coming out from this engineering colleges they are not employable and if you if you look at the news in the past uh, maybe 2 years time we have seen that a lot of colleges has been closed and now the, those uh, regulatory authorities like aict and ugc they are very strict on saying that if you don't have this this much of enrollment in the past 2 years time they have to close it down they have to close down the department and uh, the, the the fundamental fact is that the students who are coming out from the the colleges naturally they have to depend on the industry because whatever see from a parents point of view there is something called as return of investment for example uh, if if a parent is investing on 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 a student for or on his child for btech program maybe he will end up with spending lakhs and what is the time that he can get it back and it depends on the placement offered by university and the placement will happen only if the students are skilled because it, there was a day there were there were times when infosys uh, tcs and uh, cts they used to come and they used to just uh, recruit the students like anything maybe mass recruitment we used to yeah. call mass recruitment but now it is not happening the 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 companies are so choosy that they will go through each and every candidate every student to make sure that they are they are able to solve the problems given by the companies so that makes it very very important that the student the output when when you uh, priyanka was talking about the input so the the school gives us the input for the higher education sector the the school is given giving the input and higher education sector is giving the output to the industry so finally they go to industry and let me let me just ask uh, a critical question how many of our students are willing to become teachers because we find a very very we find it very hard to recruit very good candidates for teaching because the reputation of an educational institution will ultimately depend on the teaching faculty right the faculty the faculty is the core and what if all the the students are moving to the industry what will happen to the education sector and how can we nurture the talent of the teaching skills so that is very crucial so what happens is these universities of course uh, amrita is also an example amrita or any premier institution in the country they will have to depend on the industry only because ultimately their 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 products are taken care taken by the industry and we have to make sure that the students are skilled enough to get recruitment recruited and then only the parents are happy then only the students are happy then only we will get more and more students coming joining the institution so ultimately it is uh, it, it is a partnership between the industry and the academia so we we already have a have a separate department set up and you know uh, how how we inculcate those values uh, um, so when when we come to to again to the values uh, we have to first teach at least the basic manners the basic ethics the basic principles so that is very crucial now so even these values are also taken uh, into consideration by the industry when you look at an organization nobody would want students who create problems for them right so how is it possible to integrate both this the uh, uh, what do you say that that skill as well as the values both has to be integrated and uh, the 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 biggest challenge faced by the institutions is getting the best faculty naturally to teach and the partnership can evolve only if there is an industry support 
and even if there is no government support this uh, institutions can su survive only with the help of the industrial support because ultimately the products are going back to the industry so that is very very crucial when you talk about the private public partnership uh, we have to have industry because uh, i know i know some of the projects which we have we have done that is, that has been taken by, by the companies like lnt tcs or infosys and that is part of a research output so how far are we able to solve the problems in society with the help of the students with the involvement of the students and those students are taken by the industry so we we can draft a curriculum and uh, of course the government is giving uh, enough freedom in terms of you know institutional eminence or nac a plus grade so those accreditation agencies will make sure that some autonomy is given to the university and that autonomy will help the institutions to craft a syllabus for the industry and train the students accordingly so that they are placed so academia and industry partnership is very very crucial that that is the uh, need of the hour yes sir very well said that academia and industry partnership i just uh, uh, last few months uh, or maybe a year i got to know about um, that was like i got to know about three universities which closed down reason being students were unable to pay the fees university was unable to pay the salaries and finally and students these were some of them tier one tier two basically the parents chose that the child should get into some work rather than be engaged in where does and how could the government like closing off universities is not a very you know a uh, happy picture that you know here we were you know quoting the uh, statistics that so many universities and all but the reality of last a year was this and it wasn't just due to pandemic there was some other reason to it so here what role uh could uh, governments have played or what should have been played or what then what happened to those students who chose to drop out that's a very big question that's a very big challenge you see uh so i think both is, of you can address even certain yeah. yes sir i'll i'll just make a small point uh, the first thing is first thing is the the employability of these children who are passing out not have the tendency to join the institution second is the authorities are really strict now it is not just possible to get an approval for an institution just like that as it was before now yeah. that even 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 for us we found it very hard and we have to go through a two section where uh, with all this infrastructure still there were a lot of uh, questions and queries that were pointed by the uh, accreditation authorities which which is really good only i'm saying that i'm not i'm not saying that is critical uh, critically saying but it has to be there on place to make sure that the future generation is safe and the future generation the life of the future generation the career of the future generation is secured so these things are very important facilities and the faculty it has to be intact without which a, an institution should not function so that is my take on it ma'am right and so very quickly if i could have a bite from you on this this is very pertinent in the, in the past say, two three years rajasthan alone 168 engineering colleges have been closed as you so know, was telling your brother was telling this all those colleges which are not able to get at least 30% of their sanctions which they have been asked by aicit to close mm -hmm. so why closure why the students are not coming to the main reason is quality And for that, what is the deficiency of quality? Because they are having the faculty who themselves are maybe not that much qualified, getting from twenty thousand to fifteen thousand or ten thousand rupees, and that's why they were not able to deliver. And the students also, the guardian had to withdraw. And the students the next year, this one year, the students came, and next year the students didn't come. So this syndrome really has been posing a big threat for this person. When you don't get to survive. So the Charles Darwin survival of the fittest that once again really will uh, come into play. So the quality has to be quality has to be seen. And the other point earlier, one minute I will tell you, the private university now sixty percent of the total students who are in the higher education that is being catered by only private university. Total out of one thousand 
40 year old political or university from 360 universities are there which are in private sector. All central university, the state university, deemed university, all center of excellence given the status of university. But the new education policy, we are thinking some hope that definitely things will change. There will be a shift, paradigm shift. Because now the multidisciplinary education, that is no one thing that determines a student will have the choice to go for a vocational course or any other course. Number two, now the only three types of universities will be there. One will be a completely purely a research university. They will not be teaching university. Only few students will be there will be doing the research. Number two, universities like this, where the teaching and plus some research also will be there. And the third is only teaching. But one very disturbing aspect that is in the NEP, that also is a part of it. Within a few years of 15 years, all those 40,000 colleges, they all will be given the autonomy to grant degree on their own. Now itself, out of 1,000 universities that we are having, or at least 360 private universities, I can tell you more than 70% of the universities, they are simply awarding fake degrees. They are just in the business of issuing mm -hmm. degrees. So students are holding only the receipt for the payment that mm -hmm. has been given. Yeah. That, you know, that they are having given. So this yeah. is in pain. If those colleges also they will be applied to grant their own degree, they will be billing from the university. Now at least there, there is a check by the ICT or by the university to which is the bill. But if these things, but this is a time in another 15 years to have been. So ultimately it boils down that the faculty and the ratio, the quality of the teaching. These two mm -hmm. are very, very say, essential. Now, if, if most of the say, owners may, may be huge building, they just want to attract mm -hmm. the students by showing you this is our gym, this is our canteen, this is other facility. And the students, they get allured and they, and the comforts that they are providing in the hostel, that you can go and come to time you like. So these things are not going to matter. Thanks now to pandemic, that now the online teaching has come. So now all those huge structures, they are not going to come to any use. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. So if I sum up these arguments, so as Chaitanya Ji said that there has to be a partnership between academia and industry so that we can have employability. And as you said, quality teaching. And as Ms. Priyanka said that, you know, everybody need not go to higher ed, there could be vacation. So somewhere the pressure on the universities will be less and they will not just be passing out with a degree, but they will have some kind of employability. And alternatively, we can have more of vocational uh, institutes, mushrooming um, instead of just everybody going to the higher ed. Thank you so much. Moving on to uh, Ms. Priyanka. Uh, undergrad admission, you know, uh, everybody is these days talking about the admission process and our last webinar was, the episode was uh, based on it. Undergrad admission is the most important step when it comes to choosing career path in a student's life. So the decision making requires in-depth research and sometimes the parents start that research from say class eight and nine onwards engaging into and all that depends upon, you know, what are the opportunities available, then the interest, the ability and the aptitude. So, uh, and it's very difficult at the adolescent, you know, that adolescent stage to, you know, with so much of rich menu on the platter to not get enticed to all the offerings that are there on the menu. How do you support students and what challenges you foresee in helping students choose a higher ed uh, institution and obviously a course as well? Because everybody probably wants to go to a St. Stephen's or to an Oxford or so. so. how do you, would you, and what will be your message to the students of class 12? So yes, it's very yeah. easy because we are already doing it since the last five years. I wouldn't just start from the students, I would start from the parents first out there because now the preparation for higher education, we have brought it down to sixth level, grade six. The parents should set up a corpus fund for their children for higher education because higher education is set to grow expensive. Maybe when we were in college, the fee tag was in a couple of thousands out here, but now for quality undergraduate courses, we have fees in lakhs. 
and if you are talking about ivy league a post graduation or even a higher study it may come into a crore as well yes so we have to have parents who start saving early so a child's future does not suffer because they do not have the funds to pay the fee it can easily be done compounding will help out there so they have they have to invest in education one this now the portfolio building of the child starts that we give multiple pathways to children in the school opportunities to try out this and that not just to succeed that you have to come out first try it out so at least the child knows the self awareness the parent and the teachers know this is what the child is strong at if they don't have an opportunity to, to to try you can't just make guesswork you cannot give careers and undergraduate references just by saying that i thought so it would be good out there it has to be based on proven competencies aptitude and attitude will come into it so the portfolios and teachers and guidance and career department like our school has with an expert uh, psychologist out there and counselors and teachers out there working together we need to map student achievements out there eighth onwards we need to give them exposure to universities and what kinds of courses are available and what kind of careers get attached with that and let the students start to experience in internship we strongly advocate internships in workplaces so students find out what they do i'll just give an example like maybe children who are looking at a medical field they go and visit a, a hospital see what a doctor does the whole day or a student who aspires to be an uh, engineer because they are commanding a heavy salary see what an engineer has to do in a given day does that subscribe to their own personality and if they know it then the hit and trial will come back and reduce much more because we are also noticing at higher education when as schools we are monitoring at first year level there are a lot of casualties happening students not choosing the right stream student dropping years at that point of time and that sheer wastage happening a year lost is one year of productivity lost at the workspace now look at a person who retires with maybe 40 years of work life and another who's retiring at 39 years the last year the highest of exalted life we have lost out of that student so we need to preserve that so we are going to talk with them we are going to deliberate with them we give them opportunities to and the major challenge is when anybody makes a fixed mindset and do not keep themselves open to ideas okay it may not be that a stephens you've not made managed to make because your one mark was less than and you did not have the 99% but there are equally hundreds of fantastic colleges who are willing to take you at 98% go use that opportunity it's not the end of the world we have Have found time and again, average students do fantastically well in their life because they know how to balance their work and life. It is not just going to be study all the time. It is not just going to be pleasure all the time. We have to teach our students to balance the two. Second choices work out fantastically in so many ways out there, even in college admissions and even in careers and even in relationships. Maybe <laughs> you know you like somebody and you are not able to have them in your life partner. That's not the end of the world. A better person is going to come into your life who's just right for you. So be open to opportunities. Be aware and ready to grab them when they come. So <laughs> that's a, what we. Train. in our students into being very flexible we have to be opportunities there that over here okay this college has a, a closed admission but here the merit criteria has fallen down by 5% let me take the admission there this is a fantastic college for the course i want to do and then believe that that's the right college for you once you take admission because dreaming about other things and not belonging into your present out here you're going to waste your energies out there so we tell our students that if you are in our school we our school is the best school for you and your teacher is the best school for you when you go into college and you've taken admission make peace with that you know it's like marriage you might see a lot of girls or boys before marriage but you marry only one person and you have to live happily with that person then. <laughs> yes in case of career so that relationship and that you know common sense has to be very strongly practiced by the parents and the students and by educational communities then thank you so true. much uh, priyanka for giving us such a beautiful example and i'm sure students will understand that you know there is no dearth of opportunity you no need to believe and you should not have a mental block of what that the college or the university that they have ultimately it is the course of your choice that is important uh moving on to uh, chetanya ji my next question to you is that we see there is a lot of investment and a lot uh, is being done when we talk about research and development when uh we find countries like united states china south korea have invested huge in research to build a skilled productive and flexible you know uh youth 
high rates in india in contrast lack this what they are the pattern that they were following in school they follow in colleges as well now we are talking about yes you know the partnership between academia and industry that you're talking about and the internships model that priyanka uh, uh, mr priyanka is talking about how can universities step into this remodeled role seamlessly that how can there be a nice happy amalgamation between so uh, one that research to that hands on learning experience because then that will also ensure less dropouts more value in terms of you know the degrees will be more valued and it would not be just as sir said churning out a brigade of you know graduates who are jobless yes chakanna ji so i hope it was uh, to me right ma'am uh, the voice yes. was in between okay yes yes i hope you heard the question yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, the uh, basically research is ultimately dependent on uh, how far we are able to nurture the skills of the students uh, see uh, unless otherwise the student has that that problem solving skill and critical thinking skill mm -hmm. uh, research is ultimately solving a problem right they solving a problem mm -hmm. uh, uh, thinking from different dimensions right right for you you have you have told is correct Uh, it is very very important for any other country like any other country mm. for india is also it is very important and we have seen a lot of developments if you if you take the, the past one one and a half years i believe there are a lot of institutions who have come up with uh, diff different types of masks different types of oxygenators different types of health monitoring systems different types of platforms to uh, to monitor the health or different platforms to identify where this infection will be more so there are there are definitely there are skills there are skilled uh, students in fact i was replying to one of the chat uh, the question answer uh, the ceo of the microsoft the ceo of the the google uh, the the top most uh, position in ibm all those are indians so there is no lack of skills as rightly pointed by priyanka ma'am how far are we able to nurture that skill even uh, she was talking about even about the relationships you know now now if you if you look at the companies like amazon there is a post called as chief well being officer you know chief well being officer chief happiness officer which we never used to hear during our days so how is it possible for you to you know uh, uh, make your people happy make your empl employees happy so the, these things are very very important so when you talk about the research uh, ultimately boils down to a situation where Uh, each and every teacher, uh, let it be in the higher education or let it be in the school, wherever it is. Uh, now there is a there is a question uh, uh, in in the uh, Q and A. They are, they are, somebody is asking uh, who is responsible to get the placements and who is responsible to uh, make sure that the the skills are identified. See, basically myself and yourself. It is it is a community. It is not we cannot throw that responsibility to the government. So if yes. I am able to identify my students, the set of students in my class, and if everybody thinks like that from that point of view, then the nation will be great. Then the right. education will evolve. Then we will be able to nurture the research mindsets. I am I am hundred percent sure that from a class of sixty, at least five students will have that mindset. And what is the role which I play to nurture that talent, that skill? and how far are i am i able to create a thought process in the children's mind the child's mind and that has to happen in the classroom lecture or the lecture with when you deliver the class and i believe i strongly believe that nep will change because nep talks a lot about experience learning and we have to bring in the social problems inside the classroom put it in front of the children make sure that they are coming up with the so solution so that we are able to uh, to nurture that research mindset at the school level that is very important yeah. yes thank you sir because sir i think you have also answered the question by ms ritu satija who says how the implement of nep is going to change the education system in our country and i think uh, ms uh, satija uh, sir has completely answered because nep brings in a whole new perspective In, and there is a paradigm shift in the 
pedagogy in the curriculum which is more connected to 21st century and uh, we have another question and i would like to address that question to dr patel uh, will it not be challenging for the system to provide internship courses when there already is a peak in unemployment and this question is by harman ms harman preet kaur very interesting in the letter which really imparts the Certain free skills which will be required when they go to any factory or any industry or any corporate. Corporate so industry. So in our it's a traditional method of teaching also. Internship has been a part and parcel of our curriculum. Six weeks to eight weeks internship. Say if the four years course is there, either it will be seven years or third year. But two years course is there, then in the third semester or after completion of one and a half year or one year. And this is very very essential because this is just I mean arising a student within which uh, the work culture of the university, the different work situation, the different work culture, the different other person. So when we are sending somebody to any industry for the internship, then say the supervisor of that concerned industry he will be in charge, and there will be a supervisor from our college university also. They will be always taking reports from that supervisor to help our students. We are really coping up. Or whether he is displaying interest, or whether whether really he is learning something, so I feel very internship. It should be rather internship should be further increased instead of the six weeks of month. That's why now the AICT also and the new education policy they have now allowed integrated learning. Integrated learning means one year they will say learn the theoretical aspects of the college, and rest one year they will go for the internship, and if they are performing. Uh, performance is well, even if they will be absorbed also, or at least they will learn something which will be useful to them when they are going to face any interview or to any company. So the internship has to be further rather extended, or it has to be further say elaborated so that this one they uh, whatever they really learn. Now many many of the institutes now, just supposing for one year they have one month, they have taken certain classes covering some one or two units. Concerning with that unit, they will be sending a pharmaceutical student. They will be sending to any pharmaceutical manufacturing company, by which the all the formulations, all the chemicals, and all the casualties, how they are really manufactured, and what is the chemical reaction, they they will be instead of doing the practical. Unfortunately, now we say everything is blocked. Now we are not able to send the students, and virtual augmented and virtual reality is really not helping to that extent. And our students are. Really not getting that benefit, but still, so these things are there when the situation becomes normalcy. Or now, so we'll have to resort to our AI and VR, and then that practical aspect also will have to go online. That is even going also online. And over the time, for much value, we'll go to that one to them to really physically also go with the side. So this this is a part of training, and this part of training it is a practical thing that they have learned in the classroom. That implementation. That that part is to a student who learns once he goes to the start of the good stage. I think uh, Herman Kaur would have got the answer, and I completely resonate Sir's thought. One question, uh, Chetanji, I want to address this to you, the, because we were discussing uh, before uh, the webinar started that the challenges faced by this question is by Ruchika Sharma. challenges faced by student in opting for future courses after 12th during uh, pandemic and uh, you know we keep talking about in all our webinars that you know we don't even know what are the kind of courses or what kind of jobs will be created maybe to your head so what would your suggestion be considering another year uh we don't think will be fully functional when it comes to academic institutions whether it is schools or whether it is colleges so in this scenario uh what are your you understand the uh, you know the problems that the students are facing and the way the uh, curriculum is being delivered so could you address this question please uh yes ma'am uh, see i have i have seen a lot of such similar queries and um, i think at one point priyanka ma'am also suggested the same uh, 
uh, basically the schools uh, need to take some initiative from this end so that the, the students are given maximum exposure to the available branches because uh, see i am i am managing admissions uh, for engineering and uh, in the past maybe a few years what i have seen is that the students who join engineering is primarily because of the parental pressure not because of their own interest so how is it possible for us to us in the sense not as a person from amrita uh, from a teacher's point of view uh, how is it possible for a teacher to make them exposed to maximum possible careers saying that science students is not or engineering is not the only option for the science students or medicine is not the only option for the medic the biology students how is it possible for us to expose them and uh, i i again i feel that teachers will play a very critical role because if I, if i am a physics to a physics uh, uh, teacher i am expected to know where my student will be after 10 years time and i have to have that vision if i am an english english teacher uh, let us say language and literature i specialize in language and literature and what is the current scenario in that domain and how can we i expose that domain to my children my students in the class so that plays a very critical role and uh, there are a lot of organizations even i i have started now doing several ca career counseling sessions talking to the, the students about more and more uh, you know possible options if they want to choose so exposing them to maximum possible technological arena for example you know uh, for even for a bsc agriculture student we have agricultural program bsc agriculture student they are expected to know that the, the people who are working in the farm land they will be replaced by drones they have to know because that is how the things are moving now Uh, you mm -hmm. know even the police officers are using drones which means that the human engagement is very less and you yeah. get the accurate information on time so which all are the domains where the technology will be used instead of human beings and what are the skills required for those those people to survive in that sector and mm -hmm. i always uh, uh, men mention one example the toll booth in in national highways and there is no more toll booth right now one girl asked me what will happen to those people who were in toll booth they had to upskill themselves there is no other option because the the moment you are in a situation where you don't have the information uh, and there some mishap happens and you don't know wh where it has happened how it happened what is the who is the person behind that you need all this information you you will have to depend on definitely depend on technology so that that exposure to that skills exposure to the, the to the different programs available in one domain uh, at that domain my domain i if i am a computer science teacher i am expected to know if i am a physics teacher mathematics teacher i am expected to know so that has to be responsibility of the teacher it will not take much of the time it is it is yeah. just a matter of doing some online search so yeah. that exposure needs to be given and that alone can help in the long run let us not talk about only during pandemic times as as rightly point by priyanka ma'am let us have a vision let us yeah. five years 10 years so yeah so i'll just point. take this question next to priyanka ma'am because i don't yeah. want you to spill all the beans now yeah. uh, miss uh, priyanka to you uh, mrs mitali bhattacharya uh, uh, put a very pertinent question she says for students who would either go for research or appear for interviews to secure blue chip jobs or opt for self entrepreneurship what formula would teachers follow that would be a homogeneous one where a fair option is given to all students be they from any caste or class or even i would say competency now i would uh, recommend you to build upon where chaitanya ji left he had started talking about the teachers role and that is why i kind of intervened in between because i wanted you to take up this question because there's a lot of you know um, the teachers role specifically when it comes to making a student understand and explore life and explore school teachers role is uh, much more hands down i mean that is their role is because they are very impressionable at that point of time the students are yeah yes priyanka all right uh, 
uh, again, thank you. And I thank the wonderful uh, attendee who's put that across because this is the need of the hour, you know. How do we do justice to all our children? I think at the root of this, this is there. But we have to understand one thing that every student is coming from the backgrounds, context matters, yes. And that cultural context or the family context should become the strength of the child there. It is not a disadvantage there. Uh, you know, the family plays a key role. Now, the second part that we have to understand is the teacher teaches judicially to all the children, but each have different absorption powers, registering power. Even in this panel, the audience is there, but the takeaway for every audience member or for every panelist will be different based on our need there. So there is a demand, there is a supply out here, and a tectonic shift is happening. We, the teachers, have to understand, parents have to understand, and students have to understand that when the temperature boils, suddenly the frog jumps out of the water. But when when it boils slowly, 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 they don't realize and they are, uh, are not going to take preventive steps there. So those slow changes have been happening since two decades. The moment you have digital intervention coming in, anything that can be replaced by machines will be replaced by machines. It will be done efficiently. But the creative part of human beings, the social part of human beings cannot be replaced by machines there. So that is why the role of the wellness uh, or the happiness ambassador in the school or an institution will become very important but it's not a generalist role, it's a specific role. They will have to know the profile of every living being who's under them, what are their traits, what are their strengths, and what will work from them. So again, I'm coming back here to what we will have to do as teachers, we have to keep a very strong lens. As parents, a very strong lens, because our children are our treasures there. We identify talent, we identify their vulnerabilities. Wherever they have the genius, we loop them into those pathways. And those pathways can change. These are changeable pathways because every human being grows differently. Somebody who's done a computer science because they had huge interest in music can go into the music industry, developing apps and part out there, not necessarily be only recruited by TCS or a McKinsey or a Deloitte there. So there is a pathway there. So we have to look into, we are going to move from general to specialist. So the mass will have to recognize the power of the individual because it's the personal individual who makes a difference to the society who makes, is that that wonderful one which I, or a, uh, we are talking about a Steve Jobs or an Abdul Gabbar Kalam who gives the nation the standard. Priyanka, community Priyanka, love wait, wait. Standard. Priyanka yeah. you are talking about those. Here the uh, viewer has also yeah. said, yeah. how will you make uh, justice yeah. to yeah. people yeah. from yeah. Opportunities. Cast opportunities. Cast. Yes. In yes. every class, yeah. opportunities have class. to be given. We don't just pick and choose. And when those opportunities come that you can part, take part in a debate, the parent says yes, the child says yes. He does not say that I have to prepare for that IIT and that coaching because it is going to give them the communication skill to qualify the group discussion at an IAM MBA or at a uh, Harvard e exam out there. So we have to be ready. The opportunities every teacher gives. But how many students submit their assignments on time? How many students take up for every inter-school competition to participate in? And those who do, they become the path leaders. So every student gets the opportunity. We have been ready to uh, lap onto it. Like you are giving a chance to every panelist to answer and to every person, all those who are in the audience were given the chance to ask a question. How many ask the question? Those who ask have very their good. doubts explained. Yes. So very we have good, to be ready. Good. We have to make our students, you know, very aware human beings. Grab this opportunity. Do this because they have tremendous energies. They can tire us out any day. Let them tire doing things that matter. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. I think uh, Dr. Patak was saying something uh, when I was. Dr. Patak, is he there or uh, no? I think so. Uh, yes, one last line from you, uh, Chetanya ji, on the same thing, but very briefly because we are very short of time. So, uh, one last bite on how can these opportunities uh, be thrown? Uh, homogeneously to all the students. Uh, Ma'am, could you please repeat once? So, yeah. So, the, uh, the, the viewer asked this question that what formula would the teachers follow that would be a homogeneous one where a fair option is given to all students, be they be from any caste, class, I'm also adding gender here. So, yes, and the reality is this, that fair opportunities are not given.
So how yeah. will you ensure this in these? Uh, yeah. Uh, see, um, I think uh, the 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 maximum possible thing we can do from teacher's side is to expose them to maximum opportunities. See, when we when we say that, let let me let me give you a controversial example. When we say that this many percentage of seats are to be allocated for the girl students, let us assume, assume that government brings in or somebody brings in saying that you know this many students, uh, this many seats are to be reserved for the girls. We should have that many number of girls in, uh, in the entrance examination, right? So how can we ensure that that many number of girls are attending that that test? or taking the test what is the mechanism for that in instead of doing that we are reserving the seats here so let us let us not talk about reservation of this let us make sure that equivalent to males or equivalent to boys we are giving the same opportunity same uh, thing set of you know exposure to girls also and and let me let me tell you uh, yesterday i got an i got a message from one of the teachers in kochin in kerala she is asking whether a student having physics, chemistry, and biology can uh, pursue artificial intelligence program in higher education. So she, she, that girl, that girl uh, doesn't have that mathematics, and now she wants to pursue AI, and it is not possible because the, the criteria is like we need to have mathematics compulsory for the engineering schools. Now, what is the opportunity left? They have to undergo some way of, you know, getting mathematical skills and let them prove their skills. That they have that mathematical skills to pursue this program. So this is how the education system is currently. It has to change. Unless otherwise the teachers take up the steps, initiatives to, uh, to ex get the students exposed. And again, I, I'll come back to what Priyanka ma'am said. Competitions are very crucial. We have to make them attend competitions, let them taste the failures, let them work in teams, let them, uh, you know, bring their, their talent out, let them exhibit their creativity. So then only they, uh, we can, we can say that, okay, we have achieved something. And the, then, then the, it becomes the responsibility of the student to pursue a degree. It is not, it is not imposed on him because he knows that, okay, this is my first option. This is second option. This is the third option. Let it be like that so that it becomes just like that in the West. In the Western culture, they take their responsibility and our students are depending on parents and teachers. Rather, rather than imposing the degree on the students, we have to make sure that they are give, given even enough opportunities and definitely it is, the, it is the role of the teacher. For example, if it is in higher education, they have to make sure that the higher teachers in higher education are, are giving the students maximum career opportunities. And in the school level, they have to talk to uh, talk to the students about the higher education uh, possibilities. So that that is the way it has to be. So uh, uh, yeah, giving them opportunities is very important. For that, the teachers needs to get educated and trained well. And yeah, so what I gauge, yeah. So what I gauge, and uh, from your and uh, Ms. Priyanka's, uh, you know, uh, suggestions is that there exists like a symbiotic relationship where one the teacher has to give those opportunities but the student should be receptive and should yeah. also be yeah. ready to yeah. uh, you know come forward and uh, take part and yeah. uh, you know walk that extra mile yeah thank you so much all our panelists and we come to the end of our session uh, i would just say that universities and colleges are making Herculean efforts to be fair and not penalize students from circumstances beyond their control in this pandemic situation. We've had last three uh, episodes or webisodes on higher education. And so I think the from admission processes to challenges to selection of courses, everything would have been very clear to our viewers. Students should keep up their, with their studies, stay sharp with their skills and remain optimistic for the future. Hone some life skills, indulge in some uh, courses. We will be back in the next episode with some more interesting insights on National Education Policy 2020 very soon. Don't forget to join us 
a, from bottom of my heart, I thank all the panelists. See you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Devyani, ma'am, for this opportunity so that we can learn together much more. I learned so thank much. You. Thank much you.